Well, next week this time, we'll be uh, hoping that everything is going well toward Mars. Yes, yes, that's true. That's true. The Chinese right, are very welcome. quiet about there. Yeah, they are. Chinese, very yeah, quiet. very quiet. Yeah. I was really impressed with the UAE. I was impressed with the United Arab uh, Emirates. That was really fascinating. That's cool. There's a lot of stuff going on. Going to get it's going to be crowded on Mars, on Mars huh? <laughs> <laughs> February. <laughs> it's a pretty big place. Yeah, I think they can handle place. it. Too. All right. So welcome, everybody. This is our first uh, virtual star party. Um, it'll be kind of a learning experience for us. So, uh, but I have to, again, thank Dave Pesch and his company for donating the service. This is fantastic to have and no cost to us. We have as many people on as we like and, and use it as long as we like, which is uh, mm -hmm. fantastic. We don't get stuck in any kind of a crunch because of it's a, if, if it's a different service and at no cost. All right, so I will, uh, as usual, if it gets noisy, I'll mute you. But there's not a lot of people here. I don't expect it to get noisy. Some of you are just listening and not uh, on, on the microphone on. If I happen to mute you, you can you can unmute yourself. Just use the little microphone bottom microphone button at the bottom. Just unmute yourself if I happen to mute you. If you have some background noise or something, I'll I'll mute you. But I don't uh, typically it doesn't happen that often. Uh, please ask questions as I go along. If you want me to pause, I can pause. I'm going to be playing this locally. I was going to play it uh, through YouTube, but reading this, it shows that it won't record, and I want to record this so that we have it for posterity. Uh, it won't record online video if I do it, but if I have it locally, it'll record it. So that's so that's what I did. I have set up to do. Um, uh, it's always better to use a headset. You can actually get better. Uh, you can hear things better. You can tr you can um, talk better if you have a headset. If not, don't worry. Not a big deal. All right. So as I started to say earlier, this is a learning session that we did. Uh, uh, here's some of the things we learned, and you'll see as I play this uh, how this uh, you know how good this was. Uh, one thing we I learned is is how to improve my timing, and you'll notice timing from the beginning to the end is a lot better. I'm stopping and starting uh, the video recordings. Uh, the microphone pl placement in the room, I actually had a nice microphone, uh, but it was closer to me than everybody else. And I, next time I do this, I'll put it kind of in between everybody, maybe crank up the gain on the microphone so we get a better recording of everybody. Uh, and a very important thing we need is we do need to get a USB 3 connection between where I'm recording this to and from because uh, you'll see some of the video in, in spots it gets you get kind of a smudge in the video and that's just the the video was fine as i was i was i was looking at it but when i when it got moved to where it was going as it was recording it uh it kind of lagged a bit so you have this, this this smudge video so a faster connection would avoid that video corruption and delay uh, you'll see me as we take these short images. I take a histogram and, uh, and I adjust it to try to get a nice picture. And I, I think I learned during this process how to do it on the fly a lot better than I did. I, I'll start out with a decent image and then I'll kind of mess with the histogram <laughs> and it's not as nice an image then. Uh, one thing we really need is uh, I originally tried to do this streaming, and because we have uh, DSL for uh, internet service, we have a less than a gig, of, excuse me, less than a megabit of upload speed. So it's terrible. And uh, it was awful when we tried to uh, record it live. Uh, so we'll need to do get high speed internet. And I'll talk about this maybe in another meeting, but I, I'm gonna make an appeal perhaps to um, Spectrum to see if we can't get high speed internet out there. I don't know that we can afford high speed internet to, to purchase it, but I'll see if we can make an appeal to uh, Spectrum to somehow work that out. And then as we get, as I, as the people doing this get more experience with the software and make a better presentation. So that's my disclaimer. All right, here's some credits. I didn't put credits at the end, but here they are. I did the narration. Dave Bradley did uh, a lot of the telescope troubleshooting. Uh, the dark sky object selection and commentary came from Bob McGovern. Uh, and we use the uh, Celestron C14 up in the big dome in hyperstar mode, which means the focal length was f1.9, which gives us a nice uh, wide feel that kind of kind of gives you like an eyepiece feel. If you're, if you're using a telescope and you use you typically use a wide field eyepiece first to find objects 
it's actually a nice uh, nice eyepiece to observe objects in and so that's why i really felt that the hyperspar mode set up like this taking short images was a lot like doing real observing um and we will eventually you go to the uh, native uh, f11 of this celestron and we'll see some stuff in a little more detail uh planets especially uh, will be really cool to see as the summer moves on and then there's several software programs we use. The Sky 10, Sky X, was the software we used to control the scope and choose out our objects. ASI Capture was the tool that we used to capture the images. Uh, OBS Studio was what I used to record and combine all the videos. Excuse me, what I used to record the videos. And then VideoPad Recorder was what I used to edit all the videos. I, took like four or five videos and some stills, put them all together, and I used this video pad to put it all together. So it's a lot of, a little bit of work that goes into doing it. It would be a lot easier if I could just stream it and just do it once and record it, bang, we're done. But uh, so that's it, that's it. So what I'm gonna do now is I will share my screen that has the video and I will play the, uh... so this is the uh, big dome. And uh, in Ionia on uh, Wednesday night, the 15th. That's our C5, C14 um, hyperstar. And then I'll be quiet. If you need, if you want to talk or ask a question, go ahead. Are you guys hearing anything? I, I just paused everything. Are you guys hearing anything? No, I'm not hearing no. anything. No. All right. So I will. Uh, I'll I'll talk through it no. then. All right. No, we're not. We're not okay. hearing. It. All right. It might have it might have recorded very low. Let me see if I can't I can't pump it up any more than it is. So I'll go through it. All right. Back to it. Now, this is on the uh, computer downstairs, the screen downstairs. Yes. Yeah. Right. So I'm going to, yeah, this is on the computer downstairs. So we just slew to uh, M109, and then I forgot to turn on the recording for M109. So we'll move on to a little bit later. <laughs> so early on, I was able to, to mess this up pretty good. It had de dead air. We went to M109. Um, and then I finally turned it back on. And this is uh, NGC. 4214. It's an irregular galaxy up in Pegasus. And uh, I did not, we did zoom in on it and zoom out, but I didn't record that. It was all, all part of that dead recording. Kind of an irregular galaxy in, uh, in Pegasus. It's fairly close. It's about 10 million miles away. And it must have interacted with another galaxy at some point to, for it to lose its shape as a, uh, as a you know, traditional shape of look of a galaxy but it is fairly close by uh i said it was in pegasus it's actually in the conus Venetachi, is where it is and it's part of that group part of the uh, the virgo supercluster um the m94 group 
And that happens to be where we're going next. We're going to go, actually, we're not going to go to, we're going to go to M64. This is the Black Eye Galaxy. Um, that's a pretty popular place to, uh, to go so that we, So this is in Coma Berenices. It's sometimes called the Evil Eye Galaxy. It's it's one of the most. Hang on, I got I got background background noise going on. It's um it's one of the most massive galaxies in the local universe. It has a large population of globular clusters, uh, about twelve thousand. Now compare that to the Milky Way, where there's only like hundred and fifty to two hundred. Um, globular clusters in the Milky Way. And that may be part of the reason why it's one of the most, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm describing the wrong one. <laughs> Talk about the black eye galaxy. <laughs> Discovered by Edward Pigott in uh, 1779. And it was uh, again, independently by John Johann Bode and Charles Messier the same year and then a couple of years later. Um, What's interesting about this galaxy, it has a dark band of dust covering the lower front of the galaxy. We're kind of looking on looking down at it, and there's a big band of clouds across the front of the galaxy. And you'll see as I kind of zoom in here, uh, this dark band across the, the top of the galaxy of dust that blocks some of the, uh, the light from the center of the galaxy. So here we go. You can actually see some of this um, the bands around here, the arms. But this this dark band of dust is what's unique about this galaxy. As I was futzing with trying to get a better, sharper image, I ended up ruining it. But uh, it makes it really interesting. It also makes it very uh, confirmational. When you find it, you know you found it because you see that uh, that dark dark uh, shiner almost like you got a black eye and got punched and it's got this big little <laughs> big uh, spot underneath there but a cool object to see you can definitely see arms in it now we zoomed right in with an eyepiece this would be like a really this would be like a high power eyepiece going in there so that's one of the things we could do virtually that you couldn't do well with a telescope i mean you can only go so far with your eyepieces but virtually, I can just take an image and uh, zoom in, zoom out, and uh, play around with it. So this would be pretty high power looking at that, uh, at that at that level there. That would be probably you know a pretty high power eyepiece. But you could see that through a through a good telescope. All right, so we'll look for a couple things nearby. So we uh, we were looking for something in Virgo. Was too was it, see if Virgo was too far down. Here's Virgo, might be a little too far down, but we decided that we could go to M87. So that that circle shows us where M87 is. And so I used the uh, the, the sky software to slew us down to M87. So we're going to capture a two-minute image of M87. And while it's capturing, I'll tell you a little bit about it. So uh, M87 is also known as Virgo A. It's a supergiant elliptical galaxy in the constellation Virgo. It's one of the most massive galaxies in the local universe. That's why I started to describe M64 as. But it's really M87 is the, one of the massive, most massive in the local universe. It's got a large population of globular clusters, as I was saying before, um, about 12,000 compared to the 150 to 200 orbiting the Milky Way. And it has a jet of energetic plasma that originates at the core and extends at least 4,900 light years, traveling at relativistic speed. It's one of the brightest radio sources in the sky, and it's a popular target for both amateur and professional astronomers. 
This was a target of the famous black hole picture, if you remember from the Event Horizon Telescope from last year. You had, a, you had telescopes from all around the globe uh, making a globe-sized telescope by having, these, having 15 telescopes all over the place, imaging this over a long period of time, getting pentabytes of uh, information, and then, and then physically sending these hard drives because you couldn't transfer the data fast enough physically sending the hard drives all to one location to get that black hole picture that you may remember, that yellow and orange picture with a big black hole in the middle. And that was light from around behind that galaxy uh, being being by the by behind the uh, core of the galaxy getting being bent around it by the black hole, the very massive black hole in the center. So we're just a couple seconds away here from that, that developing. And here it is. It's a little indescript in this descript because it's a it's a uh, elliptical galaxy, but it is a huge, huge galaxy. Now, what you're missing because I have to talk, you're not getting the background vocals, is uh, Bob and uh, Dave talking in the background. So, so this was a, a two-minute exposure. I'm futzing around with it to try to see what we can show you of, a, of it, maybe a little bit better. If you'll notice, can you see this, this little thing here? Oh, if I stop messing around with it. All right. So you see the jet here? This is, that's the jet. It's very faint. Can you see there's like a little thing sticking out here? That jet is, um, is 4,900 light years long with matter traveling at relativistic speed. And when I say that, that means it's almost traveling at the speed of light. That is very, very fast. And to be out there uh, traveling that quickly, it's pretty amazing. Yeah, so this is this is what it would appear like under decent power. Okay, now that's about what you'd see through a, a wide field eyepiece. It's about like that. That's about high power. You see another galaxy, a couple other galaxies up here too. And you can see the screen how it kind of slips down like that. That's part of the uh, recording process we need to fix. So we, what we did now is we flipped to the other side of the meridian and we focused in low on the horizon to the Lagoon Nebula. If you've seen this, this is one of two uh, huge visible, visible to the naked eye, uh, star forming regions in the Northern Hemisphere. And this is a pretty good picture of the uh, Lagoon Nebula. Uh, this is capturing without any kind of filters and you could actually, this is me futzing with the, the histogram. Again, that's one of the learnings we had from this episode was uh, futzing around with it. But you can actually see it's pretty pink. Uh, and that's because of the hydrogen gas in this star forming region. So there's a lot going on here. There's, there are stars that, are, that were formed in this cloud out of this area. Uh, and then there's dust and matter that is forming more stars. You can see some dark lanes of dust blocking light coming towards us. And if you um, if you're a, an ardent observer, you'll find that people look for this little spot here. It's it's called the, well, if I can get the, get the video back, okay. This little spot here is called the hourglass. It kind of looks like an hourglass and that's a, it's a really bright area in that lower part of the nebula. Well, there it is. It's kind of zooming in. Yeah. So we didn't track real well, but well enough to make a wide field pretty good. But uh, you can see that the, the blur on the stars means, means we didn't track well.
So this is low in the sky in the summer nights over just above um, Sagittarius, kind of coming out, if you can imagine Sagittarius looking like a teapot. It's uh, just above where the spout is, kind of if you have the Milky Way, you have the Milky Way going up, going up. It's just to the right of the Milky Way. You'll see this little smudge in the sky. You can actually see it if you have good eyes. You can actually see it naked eye, um, the little smudge in the sky that is the Lagoon Nebula. Um, and through an eyepiece, you'd see that just like this, um, you would not see the pink. Uh, because we, we're using a camera, we're a lot. We can pick up a lot more detail. We could pick up. We could pick up some of the color, but through an eyepiece, visually, it looks a lot like this, almost identical to this. Only you don't see the color. You just see the. Uh, you just see this in kind of a grayish uh, hue, and you could uh, you could put a filter on there to try to pick up some more of the uh, oxygen three or other element bands that would give you some more some more detail on the outer edges of it. So now we're going to go to the a spot just above it. it. It's almost in the same field of view. If you had a large enough eyepiece, you could probably get them both in the same field of view. Certainly a camera can get them both in the same field of view. And it might have actually been at the edge of this image. So you see where we are now in that yellow dot. And we're actually going to move just a, a tiny little bit above it to M20 which is the, um, the Trifid Nebula. So here we are uh, confirming the slough, moving the scope over. And you can see that where the red is is where the, the nebula is. It's not moving very far at all. So, so we're going to take a two-minute image. We'll pause this video for a moment, and then we'll come back. And here we are back. And so this is the uh, automatic picture, and I, I screwed around with it immediately. I should have just left it up there. But this is uh, the Trifid Nebula, and it's interesting. It's, it's a couple different things going on here at the same time. Um, it's an emission nebula, a lot like the, uh, the lagoon was, but it's also a reflection nebula. So you get a lot of different color here. Let's see if I can find my information on here. So it's um, it's an H2 region located in Sagittarius as well. As I said, it's just above uh, M8 or the lagoon. It was discovered by Charles Messier on June 5th, 1764. You know, Trifid means divided into three lobes, and you can actually see that there's these lines here kind of divide this into one, two, three sections, hence the name Trifid. And we could, if we'll, we'll zoom in in a little bit, you can actually see a little more detail in here. And this is kind of reddish, pinkish uh, as we image it. And the stars inside are forming in here and they're also pushing away gas and dust to make these little, little dark areas where it's cleaned out around them. And then there we go. So I've, I've blown it up. So you actually see reflections off of the edges of, of gas and dust inside there. It's kind of cool to, to look at the detail. This is a double star that's in here. So it's not it's not bad tracking. We actually got pretty good tracking on this. But uh, and you can't zoom in like this with an eyepiece. This is something you that you do electronically. You have to get a really good eyepiece to kind of zoom in like that. I don't think I've seen it that high. But that's about what you'd see through a, uh, a wide field eyepiece. Over here, it looks it looks bluish. Now, not necessarily through an eyepiece. This is all gray if you're looking through an eyepiece. But over here, it's bluish. And that's because it's a reflection nebula. And that's from these stars back here re reflecting light off of that nebula. And you, hence, it looks blue to us. It's not an emission nebula where it's, it's hydrogen uh, that is ionized and then releasing releasing that the uh, light in the uh, red spectrum and it's just reflecting off of the dust there making it blue because that's the light of the star the star is like a bluish star hence for the reflection so we're going to move a little further up it's a very rich area of the sky there down in sagittarius and, you, and moving up 
the Milky Way, there's a lot of nebula to see. So we're going to image now uh, uh, Messier 17 or the uh, Swan Nebula. Now, while we were recording this, we we came up with a new name for this nebula. So if you're looking at this, you can see that if this is the level of the water here. That's the body of the swan, and here's the neck. You see the neck? All right, I'm going to ruin this for everybody forever. We've decided that this is the nose nebula. If you look at it, this is a nostril here. Here's the hole in the nostril. Here's another nostril over there, and here's the bridge of the nose. There's a nose looking out at you in space. So forever now, it'll be the, the nose nebula. <laughs> <laughs> How many people yeah, have you, I ruined for? You can see the eye there too. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you got a little eye there as well. So there, so, so there you have the nose nebula, and it actually now it looks more like a nose to me than it does a swan or omega or whatever else. <laughs> the Schnoz nebula, Bill Schlein says, I like it. I'll go with the Schnoz. So yeah, I, it's been totally ruined for me. It's now the nose. I don't see the swat anymore. All I see is the nose. Manner orientation. Yeah, yeah. And this is another uh, star forming region, just like the other ones we saw. If you could imagine the Orion Nebula, if you're familiar with it, we kind of get a face on view of the Orion Nebula. If you could turn it 90 degrees, that's kind of what we're looking at, or 90 degrees, and then tilt it, tilt it a little bit like that. That's what you're seeing. You're seeing an area kind of like the Orion Nebula, but sideways, because you had the start, you had the star forming region in here, and then you have some dark dust clouds of, obstructing some of the pieces. We have some of that going on at the Orion Nebula too. So that would be the Orion Nebula sideways. Kind of cool thing. I kind of that was kind of a, a mini highlight for me was the Schnoz <laughs> Nebula. All right, so we pause this and. I don't remember where we're heading now. Oh, this is the Eagle Nebula. So it's a look, we went down a little bit. So if you're familiar with the, um, one of the first big, you know, publicized images from the Hubble was the Towers of Creation. And this is them in the Eagle Nebula, kind of tilted about 160 degrees, 200, 120 degrees. There's the three towers, one, two, three towers of the Towers of Creation. And it kind of established the Hubble palette, too, where you had uh, sulfur, hydrogen, and oxygen as the uh, elements, the ionized, ionization of those elements uh, that give you the, uh, the palette. That's just all you're seeing there really is the, uh, was the hydrogen. So my uh, cut in this uh, segment wasn't good, so I, uh, I gave you a little disclaimer here. We went a little higher in the sky. And we went to Lyra and uh, the Ring Nebula. And we did, we, tracking was pretty good. And this is pretty faithful to what you'd see other than the color through an eyepiece. That's what, you know, that's that's through about medium high power to see the, the uh, Ring Nebula. You can actually see that it's a ring. And you can you can see that there's um, there's stuff covering the middle of the ring. So almost like an opaque part of the ring there. And you can see the central star as well. The middle is green because that's ionizing uh, oxygen and carbon. And you can see at the outsides, it's kind of reddish. That's ionized hydrogen. Um, and again, as I started to say before, looking through an eyepiece, it won't you won't see these colors unless you're using a filter. But even a filter, it filter colors it by itself. Um, you would just see kind of a, a smoke ring. Uh, a dusty uh, black and white, you know, gray tone ring is what you'd see looking through a, an eyepiece. Um, and that's pretty, uh, you know, I pumped it up quite a bit there. So that's probably through a high eyepiece, what you'd see. You can actually see the uh, central star in there. One of the easiest things to find in the sky, it sits, if you know how to find uh, Lyra, Lyra is, is a triangle that sits on top of a parallelogram. and uh, the ring nebula is right at the bottom of that parallelogram, a very easy object to find. You, um, I don't know that you can see it with binoculars, but you can find it pretty easy with a telescope. 
So then we paused. And for those of you who have joined us a little bit late, I am uh, I am uh, doing this uh, extemporaneously with um, giving you the the description because the description on the video was too low for people to hear. So I'm, I'm redoing the video, I'm redoing the uh, um, audio, if you will. So it looks like we're going to a place called NGC. Oh, I think we're going to by by Bob. Um, Bob McGovern's request, he wanted to go to the uh, Veil Nebula, and uh, I picked a spot in the sky, in the the, uh, the program, the sky, sky 10, and I was, I was off, and then I went back and I adjusted, and now we're on the spot that I wanted to see, and this is the western edge of the Veil Nebula. This part is called the Witch's Broom. And it's you could see why it's the witch's broom, and it's kind of a twisty, curly thing. On the left hand side, it's kind of thin, and on the right hand side, it kind of spreads out and it's wispy, like the uh, like the tendrils of a broom. That star that's in the middle is pretty easy to see. That's a naked eye star, so when you you could actually find this pretty easily, just star hopping uh, up in uh, Cygnus, find that star, and you can uh, find the western edge. Of the Veil Nebula. Now I zoomed in to the left side. Now you wouldn't do be able to do this with a telescope because you'd really need some pretty high power. But it kind of looks like it's uh, it's almost like a little tornado, or it's it's kind of twisting like a little vortex in space. This is the leading edge of a supernova remnant. Some twenty to some ten to twenty thousand years ago, a star supernova out here. And it's pushing all the gas and dust around it out. And uh, the stars and, and stuff around it are illuminating it. And it's actually it actually got illuminated itself. And this is the western edge of, of this thing. If we were to go across the whole thing, I'm trying to think how big this is. I think it's like three moons across, all the way across. The source star for this actually was pretty massive. It was about 20 times the size of our sun. And uh, the remnants have since covered an area, like I said, three degrees in diameter. So it's six times the uh, area of the full moon. So now we're going to move, as you can see, we were, we're over here. We're going to move to the western edge. And that's where the, uh, the software wanted to take us. And I moved it a little more center because I wanted to look at I want to see this part of the nebula. So we slewed down. <clears throat> Excuse me. And uh, we took a two minute image. I see I was getting better with our timing on here. So I paused it. And we'll come back to the, to the actual uh, image. Four seconds left. And we get the eastern side of the Veil Nebula. This is a little larger than the other side. It's actually it actually continues a lot a little further off to the to the right of this image. And it appears almost river like. And then over here, it almost looks like a waterfall coming down over here. And I, try, and I know that I try to play with this a little bit to pump it up. Uh, so bear with that going on through. Uh, through an eyepiece, this is really pretty stunning to see. Uh, the Veil Nebula. So I kind of futz around with the histogram, trying to mess around with that to get a, a better image of it. And now it's gone completely. <coughs> Excuse me. So this, these are the struggles you have with uh, video astronomy. Is is getting your you're futzing around with all the equipment. You got several different software programs running at the same time. You're recording as you're going, pausing, stopping. It's a uh, it's 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 different than just being in an eyepiece. I'll say that much. But eventually we're going to get back to the image here. And uh, if you could imagine, this is like a, a gas ball in space that just expanded. A, a star exploded. It's, it's just that that concussion is still flowing through space, pushing everything out there. And it's got enough uh, stuff in it to uh, to really. Uh, to, to really uh, show this stuff. So this is this is like the waterfall part, or fangs, as I sometimes say, of the uh, 
eastern edge. It's just almost like it's wrapping around. It, this gas plus is, is pushing out, and part of it is still wrapping back around it again. It's almost three dimensional. <clears throat> So Jeff wanted me to describe the histogram. So the histogram down on the right, uh, the left side is is black, the right side is white, and what I'm adjusting is the balance between the black and white on the uh, in the image. So we decided that we were getting pretty good images, and there's a part of the uh, of the veil nebula that you typically don't look at that often. And that's called Pickering's triangle. So here's a here's a triangle right here, Pickering's triangle. So we uh, slew over to it, and we'll take a, a two minute image of it, and it's about to come up now. And that blurring that you see is all video transfer. That's it's very frustrating. So if we have a faster transfer from what's going to the screen to what's coming back to the uh, hard drive that I'm recording it on, and that would be having a USB 3 connection. So you can see it almost looks like a piece of pizza here. It's very faint. Um, I've only seen this one time, or maybe a couple of times through, through a telescope, and it was really good seeing. I think I saw it down at Cherry Springs through somebody else's telescope. Hank, was it your scope I saw it through? Might have been Hank's scope I saw it through. He was looking at Pickering's Triangle. And uh, Hank has a big scope. I think it's, and that's why we saw it. This is only a 14 inch telescope, even though we are, you know, we do have a camera attached to it. We are, are limited somewhat with aperture. So we thought that we had a decent enough image that we were going to try to take a three minute image of it. So this was a two minute image. We thought maybe a three minute image would give us a little more detail in there. And we might have gotten, and I wasn't paying attention if that was already done or not. But we got a little more blue stuff up there, but we didn't get much uh, much else. Maybe this is the three minute image. <clears throat> yeah, so this is the three minute image of Pickering's trying a pretty faint area, not something I would look for. That's a pretty better image of it there. You can see I got a little better at this. So there's, there's a, a zoom in on the histogram. So I got figured out how to use that. And I got a little better at using the histogram. So like I said, it looks a lot like a piece of pizza here. All right. I don't remember where we're headed to next. So I'll see where we're going. We'll describe it. Oh, oh, so we're going to uh, Herschel's Garnet Star. It's also known as Arrakis. Those of you who are uh, Dune fans may recognize the name, but it's not the same. That's spelled the same. Um, this is, I will tell you, this is much better through an eyepiece than it is through uh, an image here. This is something you really need to see through an eyepiece. It's a very red star. You may see, you may catch some of the redness on this here. It's uh, it's pretty red, but in an eyepiece, it is dazzling red. It's it's striking how red it is if you see it through an eyepiece. Uh, this is a red giant. It's one of the most massive stars in our local universe. Let me get my little notes out here. Uh, it's also called Mu Cephei. Um, it's a red supergiant in Cephas, so it's it's real high overhead. So that's hence we have real nice pinpoint stars on here, so we got better uh, tracking. Uh, it appears garnet red, and it's located at the edge of an, of an actual nebula. And since 1943, the spectrum of this star has been served as, a, as the M2 standard by which other stars are classified. It's visually nearly 100,000 times brighter than our sun, with an absolute magnitude of minus 7.6. It's also one of the largest known stars with a radius about 1,000 times that of the sun. So that means if the star was put in the middle of our solar system, it would extend beyond Mars and perhaps as far as Jupiter. That's a big star. It's also a, uh, a variable, and its apparent brightness it is very erratic. 
and it has uh, it varies between 3.4 and 5.1 and has several different periods but there are consistently ones near 860 days and 4,400 days. So a variable star on top of all that. So I highly encourage you, and this is always up in the sky. It's, it's in the Northern sky, it's circumpolar. Uh, look at this through a telescope, even a, a small telescope. I'm not sure if binoculars would work, but it's, it's pretty easy to find, Musefii. It is really, really stunningly red. It does look like a, a blazing garnet. Pretty cool. Debulosity. <laughs> Sorry, I just saw that. <laughs> I'm trying to think what other information I got out here. I must have had some other conversations going on with Bob and uh, and Dave when we were doing this. So I, I like to look at this star because um, there's a lot of blue things that we'll start to look at. We'll look at some planetary nebula, blue and green, and you see the contrast to uh, a red star. It's, uh, it's pretty dramatic. So I think knowing my typical, my typical uh, MO, we're probably going to go to a planetary nebula now. So let me... Um, I think we're going to head over to okay no we're not we're going to go to a galaxy so ngc 7331 this is a pretty this was the highlight of the night was this area and uh, we'll spend a little time in this area this is up in uh in uh pegasus the horse um <clears throat> it's a very pretty galaxy this is uh easy fairly easy to star hop to and i and there it is um it's also, it's an unbarred spiral galaxy. It's about 40 million light years away. And it was discovered by William Herschel in 1784. And it's its the brightest member of a group of galaxies. You probably see some more galaxies around it now. Uh, the other members of the group are called the Deerlick galaxies. And you can see there's one here, one here, one here, one here. There's another one down here. There's a whole bunch of galaxies. So I just pointed out one, two, three, four, by six galaxies just in this little spot here. And this one in the middle is 7331, the one that's uh, the closest one. At one point in time, we thought that galaxy was the twin to the Milky Way. But since two, in the early 2000s, we pretty much figured out that the Milky Way is a barred spiral. This is not a barred spiral. It's a regular spiral galaxy, so it's uh, no longer considered the twin. But it, uh, but structurally, it's similar to ours. Uh, I don't know if we're going to zoom in or not, but if we do, you can see that the galaxy is a little uneven. You can actually see some arms and stuff in here, but the core is shifted to one side. It's kind of shifted closer to this side. It looks like there's more galaxy out here, and less galaxy out here. So the core is kind of shifted, you know, kind of shifted uh, that way. I bet. There we go. <laughs> kind of shifted the wrong way. These little galaxies nearby are actually much farther away. I told you this was about 40 million light years away. These galaxies are, are 300 million light years away. And these are all actually part of the same group that far away. So they're, they're about 310 to 320 million miles, million light years, not miles million light years away and you can see this with a telescope uh what i'm showing you here is would be through a high power on a on a pretty substantial telescope you'd need probably a uh, 12 14 16 inch telescope to get all this detail out of it in high power but you can see this through a pretty uh, pretty large telescope a modest yeah i'd say modest to large telescope you could definitely see this but to pick up these other galaxies, it might be tougher in a smaller telescope. But it's a pretty, uh, it's a very pretty area over here uh, with galaxies. Another interesting thing about this is they've determined that the spin of this galaxy is in one direction, but the core spins the opposite way. 
I don't know. I don't know why this has happened. We're not sure if the core, uh, if, the, if it was interacted with and flipped. We don't. But it's uh, it 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 is a uh, an oddity that the uh, that the core spins one way and the rest of the galaxy spins the other way. All right. So we discovered that you know in this area is another group of galaxies that uh, we like to look for called Stepan's Quintet. And there are five galaxies. Now look, if you look low and to the right in that image, <coughs> you'll see that we actually captured Stepan's Quintet. So I'm looking at the, uh, the map here to see if it's possible. And if we look down here, we actually did get it. And we'll zoom in. These are very difficult to see through a, a good sized telescope. You, you could image them and you can pick them up, but through an eyepiece, it's uh, it's hard to get them. You can see one, two, three, four, five galaxies. Visually, these look like one galaxy together. This is one galaxy visually, but there's five galaxies here. If you go on astronomy picture of the day, there's some actually stunning pictures of this. One of the galaxies is much closer than the other four. Uh, I believe it's this one over here is closer, and the rest of these are are all part of an interacting group of galaxies out there. But uh, pretty pretty cool. Actually, you know where I saw these? You will see this group of galaxies next next time you watch. It's a Wonderful Life at the beginning of the movie when the you know the power the, the Lord is talking to the angel. They show that part of the sky and different parts of Stefan's quintet light up as different voices are talking. So you'll see Stefan's quintet when you watch uh, It's a Wonderful Life at the beginning. And I think it does it again at the end. So we just looked at at least 11 galaxies all in one image. And uh, in a telescope, it'd, pre it'd be pretty easy to, to just move your scope around in that area and try to pick it up and having a software program like this is handy to have because you can actually identify what they are look them up see how far away they are it's a cool thing to do if you're uh, if you're observing to have that that program to get more information about what you're looking at uh, this is a really interesting part of the sky with all the galaxies up here in uh, pegasus so thoroughly enjoyed finding 7331 and the galaxies around it, the Deerlick group and Stefan's Quintet. So we paused and trying to see if we paused. Where are we going? I don't remember where we went after that. We, we might have gone to a uh, a uh, globular cluster. Let's see where we went. Oh, we went to the blue snowball. And we had trouble with this. So we took a two minute image and it was it was like blurred. It was like in one spot and then it shifted to another spot and there was a blur between it. We did it again. We got a spot and went to another spot and it blurred. So then we tried a 60 second shot. So I'm saving you that five minutes that it, of, of your life. And uh, we'll go right to the 60 second shot that we got of the blue snowball nebula. And this is a planetary nebula up in Pegasus. So you can see the kind of blurred, the second blurred shot we got. And the 60 second shot will come up shortly. And there it is. And this is in stark contrast to the red star Arrakis. This is the blue snowball. Uh, this is a planetary nebula. So much like our sun will do in, in four to five billion years when it uh, starts to die, a star has uh, shed off a lot of layers of its of itself and then collapsed into a white dwarf and when the white dwarf lets out ultraviolet rays it ionizes the oxygen and carbon and as it ionizes it and the electrons go back down into their normal shells it releases light in the blue green range and that's what you see when you're looking at this so this what you see this field of view that you see here would be a wide field view this is it right here I think that's it right here. I'm sorry, right, right here. And uh, it would be much bluer than you're seeing on your screen right now. It, it definitely is blue. So you do lose what you do see in color 
you lose through this program, but what you don't see in color, you actually gain. It's kind of it's kind of odd how that works. But that's the blue snowball, which is the big ball, and uh, it's it's very cool to see uh, through a telescope. So that would be about medium high power looking at that like that. Let's see if I have any other notes on the blue snowball. <clears throat> no, that was one of my uh, that was one of my wild uh, off the off the beaten path ones. So we were tracking pretty good there, pretty high in the sky. And I noticed that we track better when we're high in the sky than when we're low in the sky. So that's uh, that's another thing we need to, to, to deal with is uh, the tracking. So in the recording, I think I'm droning on here. So I think we're going to go towards Andromeda. This is actually, I, I said it's in Pegasus, but it's actually, that, that's kind of in, in Andromeda. And we had stayed up late enough at this point. It's about uh, 12.50 a.m. when we get to this point. And uh, we're going to head to the Andromeda galaxy. You can see the little red dot there where Andromeda is. <clears throat> When we get to Andromeda, there are actually three galaxies there. We don't need to take a very long image when we do that because it's pretty bright. It's the, our closest uh, galaxy outside of the Magellanic Clouds. So uh, what we'll do is we'll image Andromeda. It's about two, a little under 2.4 million light years away. And you know everything I talked about has been in the tens or hundreds of light years away. Um, yeah, Jeff, we've had. It's it's a it's an ongoing question. Jeff's asking if the tracking issue is related to telescope position and balance, and we've balanced it. Uh, we've we, you know, we've, problem is we take some stuff off, we put some stuff on, we'll move the weights. Uh, you can actually balance it, moving the weights a little. There's a couple of weights on. You can spread them out a little bit. You can push them together. So there's a little bit of a balance issue probably, and then we re we re uh, wired it. So that could have been an issue as well. Putting uh, uh, where the wires went and uh, one of the issues one of the things we're going to do is uh when we move the uh hyperstar off of it and go into a planetary mode we'll uh, run the wires through the center of the uh scope with something we can do now that we can with the new uh system we have set up that'll help the balancing quite a bit so here we are this is a uh an image of andromeda and you can actually th see three galaxies here so where that cursor is you can see I got two cursors moving here, so um, you can see one to the lower left, one big one in the middle, and then one over to the right. This one right here. This is M31. This is M32, and the one that was lower down was M110. I zoomed in so we could look at the um, the uh, dark lanes. You can actually see dark lanes like this here and here through an eyepiece. And this is pretty true to what you'd see through an eyepiece. This, is a, this would be a very wide field. You might actually only see, yeah, you probably see it like this, a wide field eyepiece. Really, you shouldn't look at Andromeda anything smaller than a wide eyepiece, eyepiece because it's it's um, it's so big. It's just huge in an eyepiece. Another object that you could see, uh, naked eye, you could actually find naked eye in the sky. Um, this telescope will take a beautiful image of Andromeda. If you were at the um, the uh, Strasbourg Planetarium for our uh, holiday party, I I had the the, the uh, hyperstar on Andromeda. I took uh, twelve, I think it was twelve images, and then some dark images, calibrated all that stuff. Uh, so this would have been like one of those images, stacked them all up and got an absolutely stunning image of Andromeda uh, with this telescope. 
but today our you know i'm just trying to show you what you'd see you know as a virtual star party looking looking through an eyepiece going from object to object in the sky so we're just taking short images but uh that's pretty cool when you see a, a galaxy that's clo that close yeah. now i don't know how much you're seeing in here but um I will I will share the uh, I will share the the a video link with you. I'm going to upload it to the Azraz site right now. This is locally, but you can actually see tendrils coming off of coming off of those dark lanes uh, in the galaxy. If you kind of if you look at it, when I zoomed in there, I actually started pointing it out. And it's hard to see here because I'm I'm, I'm I have a video that I'm sharing, and it, it, you, if you saw the video raw, you act, you'll actually see it a lot better. So we moved on to uh, M15. This is our first globular cluster for, for the evening. We hadn't looked at any so far, so we found one nice and high up. This is one of the most massive globular clusters that we know of. It's a magnitude 6.2 cluster in uh, Pegasus. It was discovered in 1746, and it was included in Messier's object, uh, object catalog of comet-like objects in uh, 1764. At an estimated 12 billion years old, it's one of the oldest known globular clusters. It's about 33,000 light years from Earth, and it's about 175 light years in diameter. It has an absolute magnitude of minus 9.2, which translates to a total luminosity of 360,000 times that of our sun. It's also one of the most densely packed uh, globular clusters known in the Milky Way. Its core has undergone undergone uh, a contraction known as uh, uh, central core collapse. And it has a density uh, uh, containing, I'm sorry, with an enormous number of stars uh, around, which probably is a black hole. And it's home to over 100,000 stars. The cluster is noted for it containing a number of variable stars, 112 variable stars, eight pulsars, and it also contains a planetary nebula called Ps1. Now it's it's a challenge for uh, astrophotographers to try to find this. You're not going to find it visually, but if you take an image of it, you can capture this planetary nebula that's in uh, M15. It, it, it much like the planetary nebulas we saw earlier, the, the they're kind of bluish, greenish. We'll see that in the um, in the middle of this uh, this galaxy, there's a place to there's a way to look for it with reference to other stars, but uh, we we weren't looking for that tonight. But uh, it is pretty to see a uh, a globular cluster. Uh, I will tell you that an image like this doesn't do it justice. An eyepiece actually gives it uh, a lot more depth. You can actually see some color in the stars. You can see the some uh, blue and white and red. Um, you can see that the stars on the, uh, you know, that are more distinct are closer to you, and the core is is like in the middle of a bunch of stars. It does you do get a 3D effect looking through an eyepiece versus looking at this image as I presented. Excuse me, as I presented it to you. That's what you'd see at this this level through a wide field eyepiece. Actually, uh, that's, that's that's medium high power. I think I'm going to zoom all the way out in a minute, and we'll uh, see what it's like in uh, wide field. Any questions on M15? See where we go next. I'll listen to my recording here. Obama government's telling a story. <laughs> Obama government is telling a story in the background when you listen, if you if you decide to listen to this again, of going to Neef one year and uh, they had a, a, a big piece of velvet cloth and they took a, uh, a piece of aluminum and a file, a fine file. They scraped some of the aluminum onto the uh, onto the black velvet and then put it up on the wall. It was like a glue, glue on, put it up on the wall and you could use an eyepiece to look at it and it looked like a globular cluster. That's kind of cool.
So just a few minutes left. Um, we're going to head, uh, where are we headed? M15. Oh, we decided we're going to go look at the two planets that are up. So we're going to go look at Jupiter and Saturn and call it a night. Now, this telescope in this mode really is not made to look at planets. Planets are better are in the in the C14 in its native mode F11 because it's a long focal length and you can get a lot more detail out of the uh, out of the camera by using that. So I started to take an image of Jupiter here, and we took a very quick image because Jupiter is very very bright. It's like a thousandth of a second, and uh, you'll see Jupiter and its four Galilean moons, but it's really blown out. So you, Jupiter is all glowing almost like the sun. So there's the one, two, three, four Galilean moons. And no matter how much I futzed around with it, and then I realized I was using the deep sky software. So I switched over to the planetary software, which, which allow me to take much shorter images. So I, uh, I set it up to, we moved to the other uh, software, which we're gonna do shortly here. See if I can uh, yeah, so, so here's the other software set up to take shorter images. So we take a couple images of Jupiter. What I was trying to do is get it so we can at least see the bands on the surface of Jupiter, which are pretty easy to see through most optical devices, even a pair of binoculars, you can see bands on Jupiter. And so we're futzing around with the uh, image amount of time we take in the image. So here we go. That's what we got. That was the best we got, and it's terrible compared to what we can do in its uh, in its F11 mode. And so that's what we'll do, uh, whether it's the next star party or not. We'll uh, we'll try to do this, get Jupiter in uh, capture Jupiter through the in the F11 mode. You can actually see detail by imaging Jupiter. You can actually see detail of swirls on the surface. You could see a lot more bands. You could pretty much what you're seeing is you've got you got two bands, band between, and maybe you can catch some, another band over here or something. But you don't see a whole lot of other detail. But if we take it, if we image it in the um, in the native mode for the C14, we'll get a lot more detail. But that's what you'd see. That just like that would be through a regular you know a regular wide field eyepiece but you'd see the moons. And so we decided to go one more one more place. Let me see if I can find it. We decided to go to Saturn. Well, Saturn's pretty blown out here, so we're gonna, we're gonna take a, uh, change the images on the fly. So I'm able to use this little slider here to, to change the exposure. And I'm taking an exposure, I have it constantly taking images, so it's going, and the fact that they're, they're millisecond images makes it real easy to do this. If they're two minutes, like we were doing earlier, uh, you can't get them back that fast. But because they're like millisecond images, it updates pretty quickly. So that's what you see with Saturn. You can see the rings. You can see the space between the planet and the rings. But that's about it. You don't see any detail. You can't split the rings. You know, you can't see the... Uh, the uh, Cassini ring in the, in the middle there. You can't see... Typically, you can see at least one band on the the uh, cloud deck of Saturn, uh, but you don't see that here. And again, that's this is an object we'll come back to when we're in the native uh, uh, F11 setup for the C14 using uh, using this camera. So. Later on, I'm going to pause this for a second. We actually were able to see moons. Can you see the moons around around it here? Let me see if I can. Uh, uh, no, I can't. There's actually one up here that's underneath uh, one of our photos. There's a moon up here, and then there's uh, that's Titan, and then there's uh, two others. And if I zoom out, there's another one way out here. But Saturn has a whole bunch of moons. In fact, I think Saturn had. A, probably another dozen moons that were found 
uh, on, around it uh, recently. But that is Titan. That is the, I think that's the, not the, it's the second largest moon in the solar system, but it's the only one that has an atmosphere. And I, as we were talking here now, I don't, you don't hear the background, but uh, Dave, uh, Dave Bradley talks about having lakefront property on Titan. Of course, the lakes on Titan are made out of methane, but that's a whole other story. But uh, that was the end of our night. It was, uh, it was 1.10 a.m. at that point, and we've been out there since about 9 o'clock, so we, uh, we called it a night at that point. And uh, that's about the extent of our star party. So I hope you guys enjoyed it. Um, would you guys like to do this again, maybe with a little more professionalism involved? <laughs> <laughs> It was fine. That's it. it was great. Yeah, very good. Yeah. That's good. Well, next time I'll try to get the audio because I, I knew the audio was low, but I didn't realize you wouldn't hear it at all. So I'm glad I had my notes in front of me so I could uh, I could describe the stuff. So what I'll what we'll try to do is we'll do this again. And we have a we've like I said we learned a lot, but I wanted to get this this version out just because I I've, I've been hyping it for a while. I want to make sure that people got a got a sense of it. Um, and we'll uh, we might we might even do uh, themes uh, on uh, when we do this a couple more times. We'll look at planetary nebula one night. We'll look at planets and solar system stuff the other night. So, well, all right. Comments? Anything? Anybody? Anybody? It's starting to get dark. It'll be uh, sunset happens in two minutes. Nautical twilight starts at nine fifty two. So it should be dark by dark enough by nautical twilight to see Neo Wise pretty well. Jeff likes the theme, yeah. We'll have to see if we can't get. Uh, you know, I, I'd like to do. I, I'm a planetary nebula hunter myself, so every every time I observe, I look for planetary nebula. Sometimes more than I should. So <laughs> that'll definitely be a theme. Uh, there's a lot of. Uh, globular clusters and they take different sizes mass their uh, shapes not, not so much shapes but uh, density some are really dense and tight some are wider well, that might be a theme as well see a couple guys are typing band on the room was that over the uh the jupiter bill <laughs> All right, feel free to unmute yourself. I muted a couple of people because I was hitting, hearing some background noises. So feel free to unmute yourself if you want to talk. I could pull the audience, Jeff. Yes. Yeah. Good idea. We could do a uh, we could do an astro quiz. Not a bad idea. I want to make a couple of notes. Okay, well, that's all I have, folks. Who's going to go out and look at the comet tonight? I'll put a poll up. I'm going to stop sharing this screen, so I'll go back to the other screen. So how many people are going to go look at the comet tonight? How many, how many people are going to go to bed after this? No. <laughs> okay. It looks like most of us, I got a re results of 90%. It's there. It's out there, yeah. All right. 
All right, well, that's all I have, folks, unless you guys want to talk about something. Thank you very much. All right. Thanks, everybody. Thanks. Appreciate your appreciate your coming. Uh, we'll do this again. I'll give you a little more notice next time. I know I, go, I gave you notice yesterday, and I'm a, I appreciate everybody coming who came. Uh, I, I hope to have a lot more notice next time we do this. I learned a lot doing the first uh, version of this. And it'll be a lot easier next time around. So, and actually get a little better about a little volume. Um, so, uh, thanks for coming, everyone. I'm going to end it. Thanks. Thank you.